dear audience, uh, we are on the uh, second week or second time of of uh, session of uh, reading and discussion of uh, uh, Sheikh Abbaqa Surajuddin, Book of Certainty. Uh, last uh, time, uh, Dr. Reza Shah Kazami started by uh, putting the context of the books yeah, uh, before uh, proceeding further into the content of the book. I think uh, from on, on that note, I think I pass back to uh, Dr. Reza Shah Kazami. Uh, he will uh, uh, explain further the context of the book and, and, and perhaps uh, we can move to the uh, preface as well as the uh, first chapter of the book. Yeah. yeah. Please, Dr. Reza. Thank, thank you very much, Mr. Khalid. Um, actually, I'm going back a little bit before proceeding to chapter one. We won't have to go over the preface again, but uh, uh, last time I mentioned the anecdote concerning uh, Sheikh Abu Bakr, Dr. Lings's um, belief or feeling that there was a kind of overflow of the blessings, the barakah of the Quranic revelation some decades after the, the revelation in England, in the north of England, uh, in respect to a saint called Cadmon. And I made reference to it in a rather um, vague and general way, but I thought I would begin just by doing something that I think Dr. Lings would want me to do, which is to give the age number of the book where the story is found so that people can actually look it up for themselves. So this is Bede's Ecclesiastical History of the English People, um, a very, very influential, important early book on the church in England and the, on Christianity in the seventh century. Very, very early and just as I say, just after the Quranic revelation. So I'll just read, this is from page uh, 215 of this Oxford World Classic edition. Chapter 24. In the monastery of this abbess, that's St. Hilda, there was a certain brother who was specially marked out by the grace of God, so that he used to compose godly and religious songs. Thus, whatever he learned from the Holy Scriptures by means of interpreters, he quickly turned into extremely delightful and moving poetry in English, which was his own tongue. By his songs, the minds of many were often inspired to despise the world and to long for the heavenly life. It's true that after him, other Englishmen attempted to compose religious poems, but none could compare with him. For he did not learn the art of poetry from men, nor through a man, but he received the gift of song freely by the grace of God. Hence, he could never compose any foolish or trivial poem, but only those which were concerned with devotion, and so were fitting for his devout tongue to utter. He had lived in a secular habit until he was well advanced in years, and had never learned any songs. Hence, sometimes at a feast, when, for the sake of providing entertainment, it had been decided that they should all sing in turn, when he saw the harp approaching him, he would rise up in the middle of the feasting, go out and return home. On one such occasion, when he did so, he left the place of feasting and went to the cattle buyer, as it was his turn to take charge of them that night. In due time, he stretched himself out and went to sleep, whereupon he dreamt that someone stood by him, saluted him, and called him by name. Cadmon, he said, sing me something. Cadmon answered, I cannot sing. That is why I left the feast and came here, because I could not sing. Once again, the speaker said, nevertheless, you must sing to me. What must I sing, said Cadmon. Sing, he said, about the beginning of created things. Thereupon, Cadmon began to sing verses which he had never heard before in praise of God the Creator, 
of which this is the general sense. Now we must praise the maker of the heavenly kingdom, the power of the creator and his counsel, the deeds of the father of glory and how he, since he is the eternal God, was the author of all marvels and first created the heavens as a roof for the children of men. And then the almighty guardian of the human race created the earth. End of quote. This is the sense, but not the order of the words which he sang as he slept. For it is not possible to translate verse, however well composed, literally from one language to another, without some loss of beauty and dignity. When he awoke, he remembered all that he had sung while asleep, and soon added more verses in the same manner, praising God in fitting style. So you see the extraordinary similarity of a man who says, I can't, you know, the angel said to the holy prophet, Iqra, bismirabbika ladhi khalaq. It's all about sing, recite in the name of the God, of God who created. Exactly the same sequence. And first, of course, Kadmo says, I can't sing. That's why I left the banquet. Exactly the same with the prophet. And I can't recite. I, don't, I can't read. So um, it's an extraordinary thing that Sheikh Albaq has drawn our attention to. Now, let's proceed. Um, and what I thought we would do is for about half an hour, 30 to 40 minutes maximum, we will begin um, with chapter one. So, chapter one, page one, the truth of certainty. Moses said to his household, verily beyond all doubt, I have seen a fire. I will bring you tidings of it, or I will bring you a flaming brand that ye may warm yourselves. Then when he reached it, he was called, blessed is he who is in the fire and he who is about it and glory be to God the Lord of the worlds for and 27 verses 7 to 8 that's the surat al-qasas 27 if I'm not mistaken surat al-namr surat al-namr the end have you got the Arabic then yes. actually I'd like to um, ask um uh, Abdul Rahman, just to read the Arabic of that for us, so that we can get into the the language of revelation from the beginning. Bismillah. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. If all of us are the only ones, we are the stoners. So Ati kum minha bi khabar, aw Ati kum bi shihab qabas la alla kum tasalum. لما جاء نودي أن نورك من في النار ومن حولها وسبحان الله رب العالمين سلامت الله العالمين العالمين So, we begin. In every esoteric doctrine, there are references to three degrees of faith. And in Islamic mysticism, that is, in Sufism, these three degrees are known as the law of certainty, ilmul yaqeen, the eye of certainty, aynul yaqeen, and the truth of certainty, haqqul yaqeen. The difference between them is illustrated by taking the element fire to represent the divine truth. The lowest degree, that of the law of certainty, belongs to one whose knowledge of fire comes merely from hearing it described, like those who received from Moses no more than tidings of the burning bush. The second degree, that of the eye of certainty, belongs to one whose knowledge of fire comes from seeing the light of its flames, like Moses before he reached the bush. 
the highest degree, that of the truth of certainty, belongs to one whose knowledge of fire comes from being consumed by it and thus becoming one with it. For this degree belongs only to the one. The realization of this oneness is here implied for Moses in that he is summoned into the divine presence with which the bush is surrounded. Entry into that presence is the equivalent of entering into the fire. Blessed is he who is in the fire and he who is about it. In another chapter of the Quran, also with reference to the burning bush, this supreme experience is confirmed by an additional symbolism. And when he reached it, he was called, O Moses, verily I am thy Lord, so take off thy two sandals. Verily thou art in the holy valley of Hua. Quran 20 verses 11 to 12. When Moses reached the burning bush, his extinction in the truth of certainty is represented by his taking off his sandals, that is, by removing the very basis of his apparent existence, apart from the Creator, in the two created worlds, heaven and earth. Nor could he do otherwise, for the name of the valley means, according to the commentary, rolling up, Hua, as in the verse which describes the last day as the day when we shall roll up the heavens as at the rolling up of a written scroll. To have been divested of all otherness, is to have attained the degree of universal man, al insan al kamil, who is also called the Sufi. But strictly speaking, it cannot be considered as a degree at all, for it is no less than the eternal and infinite oneness of God, the certainty of whose truth it faces all except itself. Therefore, it is sometimes said that the Sufi is not created. A Sufi lam yukhlaq. Since the truth itself is not created. And it, that is the truth, it has effaced in the Sufi all that was created, leaving only itself. This identity of universal man with the divine truth is affirmed in a holy utterance, Hadith Qudsi, of the truth itself, speaking through the mouth of the Prophet. My slave ceaseth not to draw nigh unto me through devotions of free will until I love him. And when I love him, I am the hearing wherewith he heareth, and the sight wherewith he seeth, and the hand wherewith he fighteth, and the foot whereon he walketh. The same is also expressed in another utterance attributed by Sufis to the Prophet. I am Ahmad without the letter Meme. I am an Arab without the letter Ain. Who hath seen me, the same hath seen the truth. And the footnote I'll read and I'll finish the, the reading here. Ana Ahmad bila meen, ana Arabi bila Ain. Man ra'ani faqad ra'al haq. Ahmad, like Muhammad the Glorified, of which it is the superlative form, is one of the names of the Prophet. <coughs> Another name is Taha. <coughs> right, we will stop there. It's two and a half pages. And 
let's well first of all i will open up to any questions before i start to comment on anything so are there any questions that occur on the basis of those two and a half pages If there are no questions, um, I shall begin with a brief comment on what Dr. Ling says about the three degrees of faith. Now, as he says in the Sufi doctrine, these three degrees are referred to in terms of firstly, their ilmul yaqeen, the knowledge of certainty, the knowledge that is itself certain knowledge, but which is knowledge of that which is yaqeen, absolutely certain. So it's the prefiguration of the following two degrees. It's knowledge that you hear, law, he's put the old English word law of certainty, the, the doctrine, the teaching, the tidings. You hear about this thing that is pertaining to the absolute, which is absolutely certain. So when you hear about this doctrine, it awakens within you something of that certainty, which will be brought to fruition only when you are completely one with the absolute, when you are burnt in the fire of the absolute, which is referred to as the symbol of the Hakul Yaqeen. But before you get to this supreme state, which Dr. Ling says is not really a state or a degree, because it is absolute, perfect, infinitude, beatitude, cannot be referred to, strictly speaking, as a degree, it's ultimate reality. But before you go from hearing about this ultimate reality, and being burnt within the fire of that reality, being extinguished completely in terms of your otherness of this supreme reality, there is this intermediate degree, which is the Ayn al yaqeen the eye of certainty. Now, both of these concepts, the Ayn al yaqeen and the Ilm al yaqeen they are referred to in, in one particular story, which we'll come to later. But the key point here is that the Sufi is the one who travels from the outer circumference of the religion that Islam constitutes, and this can be transposed to every religion. The Sufi is one who goes from the circumference, which is likened to the Sharia, towards the center, which is the Haqiqah. The haqqul yaqeen, the haqiqah, the ultimate reality, is that central point which is indefinable and which is, geometrically speaking, it's ungraspable. That center point, you can always get another center to that center, another center to that center. So that center stands for the absolute, which unfolds in infinitude in a manner that completely transcends the plane upon which the circumference and the radii leading from the circumference to the center, they operate. They need the dimensions of relativity, of, of space. Whereas the central point transcends the plane of the dimensions of space. And it is a perfect symbol for the absolute which transcends all relativity. So the Sufi, according to the traditional doctrines, is the one who travels from the circumference of the Sharia along the radius of the Tariqa to the reality of the Haqiqa. And the, uh, the movement, the initiation of the movement away from the form and towards its own quintessence is that first step on the path that goes from the ilm al yaqeen you've heard about this thing but now you have to travel on the tariqa where you're beginning to have the eye of your heart the ayn al qalb 
which is what this Ayn is all about. And remember, in Arabic, Ayn means both the eye and also the fountain, a source, you know, or yun. And also it means the, it, it's, uh, it has the connotation of the essence of something. Aynuhu, the very thing itself. So this Ayn is a means of identification between the subject of vision and the object of vision. So it's with the eye of the heart, not the outward eyes, but the Ayn of the Qalb, that the Ayn al-Yaqeen is attained, a vision of the fire, as opposed to just hearing about the fire from somebody else. So when you're on the circumference of the circle and you hear about this mysterious thing, the absolute, remember what the Sheikh al-Alawi said when asked by Dr. Uh, Marcel Carré, how is it that you have these hundreds, thousands of disciples that come to you from all over the country and you have no means of propagating, you have no propaganda, you don't send people out, they just seem to come. And this, the sheikh apparently said to him, they come to me because they are haunted by the idea of God, of God's proximity, of God's presence, of God's reality in the midst of this world. They're haunted by the idea that God is closer to man than his jugular vein. They're haunted by that idea. So they've heard about it and they want to know more because it's awakened in them just hearing that there are people who have attained this degree of certainty and that the radiance of walaya, of sanctity, emanates from these people. And this is proof that they are absolutely embraced, if not by the uh, burnt in the fire, but embraced by the presence that surrounds the fire. So they have attained a degree of sanctity. And that you hear about this and you hear about their doctrine, you think, ah, it awakens in me a desire to move towards that myself. I want, I need to enter into this sphere of certainty that gives rise to sincerity, ikhlas, that gives rise to sanctity, walaya. So all of these things are heard about and you feel the need to move towards it. Now, um, the three degrees, Dr. Lins here says, of faith. So we're talking about Iman. And certainty, Yaqeen, can therefore be called, in its initial phase, a degree of faith. But certainty is higher than simply faith qua belief. But we must remember that the word in Arabic for faith is Iman. In Arabic, you can also say Iqan or Yaqeen. With that connotation of the fourth form of the Arabic verb of making something. So Iman is not just faith as an abstract concept. Iman is an active, dynamic process by which faith and security is established in the soul because the root of this word iman, as we see in the name al-mu'min, we don't refer to God as al-mu'min, meaning the believer. We say al-mu'min is the one who gives security, who gives you protection, who gives you this um, secure foundation in faith. So iman is the process by which you are given that fundamental, absolute rootedness of security in faith. Iqan is the process by which you attain certainty. Islam is the process by which you submit and thereby gain peace. So it's making peace through submission. And Ihsan, to go back to the famous Hadith Jibreel, where the Prophet was asked about these, these dimensions of the faith. Ihsan is not simply virtue or goodness. It's making beautiful, coming to husam through an active dynamic process of assimilation and radiation. So these three degrees of faith are three degrees 
that take you from a conviction or a belief into the air, which is always susceptible to doubt. If it's only on the mental plane and it's a logically constructed belief and it's using data, even if it's using data from revelation, if that part of the consciousness that is addressing that data is only the rational mind, then that same rational mind will be able to raise all sorts of doubts because what is constructed by reason can be deconstructed by reason. But what is established by the heart and by the deeper degrees of consciousness is not susceptible to doubt. So that is the difference between a conviction which is dubitable and a certitude which is indubitable. Un, it's not susceptible to doubt. That's why this whole thing is called the book of certainty. There is no doubt. La reba fi. There is no doubt about this. So let's see if anybody has any question based on what I've just said now. If there are no questions, I will continue with the reading. Um, Actually, I'll, no, I'll continue with a, another comment on uh, yes, the, the, the doffing of the, of the sandals. Take off thy two sandals. I'll go to that. But before I do that, is there anybody who has any question? I had a question about the um, about attaining the degree of certainty. I don't know if this is addressed later, but um, how, how does one know? Um, I mean, the, there's this idea of being consumed by the fire. So the idea is that there is no doubt. It's very clear. But how do you take into account this idea of self-deception? Because there are many people who claim to have spiritual states who may genuinely believe it, but they may actually be, you know, uh, going through experiences that we past that we would consider to be um, invalid, like heterodox New Age movements and that type of thing. But they claim to have had those types of experiences, so they claim to have attained some some degree of realization. So, how do we how do we know within ourselves? whether we have actually attained something or whether it's just self-deception. Yeah. Well, as I was saying about the difference between um, mental conviction and spiritual certitude, um, one of the signs that what you have is only on the rational plane is that you will be prey to doubts. And similarly, one can say about spiritual experiences that, uh, as Shuan has said somewhere in, in the book Esoterism as Principle and as Way, the chapter concerning apparitions, visions, auditions, apparitions of a, apparently a celestial order, he warns us that, the, that many um, charlatans will fall prey to these outward experiences. And the key distinction to make here is between what is a phenomenal experience as opposed to a principial certitude. Because even if you have a vision of an angel or this or of that, it remains a phenomenon. Even if it's a celestial phenomenon, it remains a phenomenon. And this is distinct from the noumenon, numinous reality. Phenomenon is what comes out of what is in itself numinous and above and beyond all manifestation. So what pertains to the world of phenomena pertains equally to the world of that which can be doubted, all phenomena. Because when you're talking about certitude, you're talking about pure principiality. The purity of your certainty, the, the totality of your certainty, relates to the absolutely supra-phenomenal nature of the principial reality. So always keep in mind the distinction between phenomena that can give rise to states, ahwal, states of consciousness that come and go, as opposed to the principle 
the principles of ultimate reality, which do not come and go. They are not transient. They are not bound by time and space and form and ethereal substance, whatever it may be. So when a person claims to have attained some degree of realization of maqam or anything, and it's based on something to do with states of consciousness, as opposed to the indubitable certitude, which leads to total sincerity, ikhlas, which in turn radiates, as I've written a, a chapter on Dr. Ling's, the sanctity of sincerity, that where ikhlas is perfect, where you're purified of all of your egotism, all of your pretensions and vanities and delusions, then what streams forth from a really sincere soul is the purity of the divine radiance, and you feel it, and you don't depend upon some phenomenal manifestation. You know with absolute certainty that this person is rooted in that absolute certainty, and that from him, as a result, comes. I'll give you a little example, uh, an anecdote. Um, we were with Dr. Ling's, um, my wife and I, my, uh, my late wife, Noreen, and I took him to a talk in Notting Hill Gate in London, and it was at a, a church. Uh, I think it was organized by the Temenos Academy, and it was in this church which had a roof of glass. So the sky was completely visible through the glass. And it was a talk, I think, yes, it was a talk on, on Genon and Shuan. And he said that when I first read the works of René Genon, it was as if I was struck by lightning. And the very moment he said that, the sky lit up with this enormous strike of lightning. It was an incredible, it was almost like cosmic stage management. An amazing experience. Everyone was sort of looking at each other to say, did you see it? How did that happen? And he didn't bat an eyelid. He just carried on with the talk. And, and there was no lightning before that, and there was no lightning after that. It was just that one bolt from the blue that came to say, well, this is what it was like, people. <laughs> this is what it was like. So uh, afterwards in the car, uh, we were sitting and, and they were driving along, and I said, um, Sheikh Obaik, did you notice that when you said that you were struck, it was as if you were struck by lightning when you first read the books of Genon. Did you notice that the whole church was illuminated by lightning? And he just said, yes, yes, I did notice. And then just brushed it off like we would brush off a fly, as if, you know, what importance should we give to such trivial things like that? You know, so he was constantly uh, making us aware of the absolute spiritual imperative of distinguishing between phenomena and principles. Phenomena can be doubted, principles cannot. Intellectually indubitable principles, we cannot doubt mathematically that two plus two equals four. We cannot doubt that the absolute reality of God is perfection, felicity, it's this, it's that. It, these principles are indubitable. We know with our heart that the absolute reality is the sovereign good. That cannot be subject to doubt. We know with absolute certainty, la ilaha illallah, there is no reality but the absolute reality, there is no divinity, but the one and only divinity, that there is no felicity outside of that reality, and so on and so forth. We know these concomitants of intellectually indubitable principles with that element of indubitability within our own souls, because we are made in the image of God. The heart is the throne of the all-merciful, the throne of our Rahman. So it's with our heart that we can have access to these principles of certainty that give rise to absolute uh, to 
the certainty that, in the words of Shuan, leads to celestial serenity. I can't remember where he says that, but this is a, a sign, if you like, of a true master. And I remember Dr. Ling saying, Sheikh Obak saying about Sheikh Isa, Richard Shuan, that I, I think last time I may have said this, but it's worth repeating that when he first met Shuan, he said, I was aware with an indubit, with, with a certainty of the heart, not a conviction of the mind, that I was in the presence of the greatest sanctity, the sanctity of a Meister Eckhart, of a Shankara, of an Ibn Arabi, of a St. Francis, of a Sisi. And never for a moment in my 60 years of being his disciple have I deviated or moved away from the certainty of the heart. Now, another thing that he said when he met Shuan was that he was aware that Shuan, this is the age of 27, 28, whatever they were, they were in their late 20s, that this man had this amazing depth of serenity, that there was such a tremendous well from which this serenity rose and radiated to everybody. <clears throat> tremendous peace. Now, I would really strongly recommend all of you to look at, again, esoterism as principle and as way, <clears throat> and to look at the chapter entitled The Virtues. In that chapter, Shuan talks about what distinguishes a natural virtue from a supernatural virtue, from a spiritual virtue, um, and says that ordinary Virtue is like a social asset. It's just one dimension of perhaps something you were born with and you manifest it to others. But true virtue, whether it's generosity or humility, charity, compassion, whatever may be the, the virtue in question, it will be true and supernaturally efficacious, spiritually galvanizing to the extent that this virtue encompasses the whole soul and coincides with. I forget the exact words, but coincides with a fundamental impartiality. So you take no pride in having this virtue. It coincides with total objectivity. You're aware that this virtue belongs to God, not to your subjectivity. And it's accompanied by a serenity that is already celestial. Now, there's a criterion for you. When you, when you say to yourself, forget about ahwal and states of consciousness, but if you're just focusing on virtues, which we all are obliged to strive towards in the jihad al-akbar, we are all obligated to virtue. We must strive for it. We must seek to, be, to enter into it, every, all of the fundamental virtues. We stop and ask ourselves, is this really coinciding with a, oh, he also said in that passage, a transcending of oneself a fundamental impartiality and objectivity, and a, uh, a serenity that is already celestial. So if we realize that in our strivings, we don't experience this serenity that is the proof of the efficacy and authenticity of our virtues, then we know there's something wrong. Um, so we have to you know. Put, put it right. We have to try and put right what is wrong within ourselves. So a little anecdote on this question of the different, you're going back to your question, um, phenomena, states of consciousness versus principles. The, the, I heard this story in Bosnia, and uh, it's a bit naughty, um, but I think it, it makes a good point. Um, a, a Sufi master was traveling with his disciples, going from village to village. And he came to a particular village and, and, and uh, was preaching. And then he performed a little miracle. And the villagers were astounded. You know, he produced an apple or something, saying, you know, I can show you the fruit of my, my great spiritual station. And he apple just came. <laughs> so 10 members, the 10... Uh, inhabitants of the village said, oh, this man is incredible. It must follow him. 
So they went with the entourage, now swelled by an extra 10, and they went up to a hill, and the donkey on which the sheikh was riding let off wind in a particularly loud and obnoxious manner. And to the 10 disciples that had joined him from the village, they ran away. And the sheikh said, those people that came to me because of one phenomenon left me because of another phenomenon. But they're basically the same. Whether it's a phenomenon that produces a miracle or a phenomenon that produces a curse, it's the same. It's on the phenomenal plane. So if you're attracted to me because of these phenomena, you will be repelled from me from other phenomena. So it's a very nice story. And also, on a more serious note, I should say also what Shuan says in, um, in the um, esotericism as principle and as way, that, um, that the devil can produce nine phenomena, can tell you the truth, predict the future nine times, only in order to deceive you on the tenth. So there can be all sorts of wonderful experiences and prophecies and things that come true, but it's all a kind of istidraj, a gradual punishment being given to you for that tenth time when you want to be deceived. So if you, the only way you can actually eliminate this from your soul is to say to yourself, I only want God. I do not want a spiritual experience. A spiritual experience is something that can be true and it can be false. But this is where the Sufis make this distinction between the ilm al-khawatir, the knowledge of incoming thoughts, um, in rushing opinions, ideas that come, that there are the, 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 the in three degrees of it, the khawatir, the thoughts, the quote, inspirations, can be either from the devil, shaitaniya al-khawatir al-shaitaniya, then al-khawatir al-insani or nafsaniya on the level of the soul, and then the khawatir al-ilahiya or malakiya, the angelic ones. So those are the three kinds of thoughts to come, and we have to be very discerning uh, as to the source of them. Um, Chuan also says in that chapter that, of course, you may have spiritual experiences, true celestial apparitions. And if they are true, you must be grateful for them. But the criterion of their authenticity is the long term impact it makes upon your soul upon your character upon your orientation that does it take you up into pride for a fall or does it take you down into a deeper sense of humility and awe and gratitude for what's been given so he says you may receive graces and you must be grateful for them but this is the crucial point you must never base your life upon those experiences your life, your spiritual life, your outward life must be based on principle. Principle and the actions that correspond to those principles, which are fundamentally the remembrance of God, prayer, meditation, invocation, recitation. In one respect, that's all attuned to the pure principles that are indubitable. And on the other, a constant striving against one's own imperfections, faults of character, and so on. That you can't doubt either. So when you're doing those two things, when it's, to quote the monastic, uh, ora et labora, prayer and work. So it's, it's prayer that opens you up to the ultimate reality, and that work, the jihad, is against your concrete imperfections. Eliminate them, fight against them, and then God's qualities will come through you, but it's got nothing to do with the level of experience, the, the, the level of experiences or phenomena. 
And the group within Tasawwuf that I've come across that puts that helps help me more than any other group or any other perspective to understand the absolute importance of marginalizing and minimalizing your attention to phenomena, to experiences, are the group known as the Malamatiya. Now, this is not the Malamatiya that we hear about, the kind of sensationalist Malamatiya who deliberately do bad acts in or, or questionable acts in order to elicit the blame of conventional people. These are the Malamatiya about whom Abdurrahman as writes. The Malamatiya who actually say that don't even take joy or, or delight in your spiritual experiences because they can open up your naps, your soul, your ego to all sorts of delusions. And so that group, the, the, the Malamatiya, the people of blame, are the ones who don't want to talk about. In fact, they are blamed by the more conventional Sufis because they seem to be so boring. They only want to talk about the Sharia and fine points of law and say, get on with your prayers and do this, that. And then don't talk about maqamat, the stations, the states, anything. Keep everything rigorously inward. Don't have anything to do with the outward world at all. Yes. Uh, uh, Ibn Arabi sums up and he says the Malamatiya are the chiefs of our group. They're the highest. Uh, and the, the, he said the Prophet Muhammad was one of the Malamatiya. He was the leader of the Malamatiya that hide their states, hide their, their realizations behind a veil of apparent conventional piety and normality. They're the highest of the Sufis. Um, Ibn Arabi sums up their approach by saying that these are the ones who understand Sufism to be the five daily prayers and the awaiting of death. They just do their prayers and they wait for death. Nothing. Nothing else. It, it seems very boring, very conventional, but it hides the highest stations of consciousness that they just don't talk about. Right, so thank you for that question. And I think maybe we have time for one more. Yeah, maybe we have time for one more We uh, before we stop. I've been told by the timekeeper here <laughs> that we, we've already nearly been an hour. So if there's one question that anyone has, we can go to it. Otherwise, uh, we will... Next time, just one question, uh, Teresa. Yeah. Uh, uh, in the in the uh, 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 doctor doctor Links mentioned that the Sufis are the third degree. Uh, the Sufis are in the third degree. So, what about the other the, the first uh, the first two? Who who are they? Well, he's he's not making any kind of hard and fast distinction. He's just saying that the the true Sufi. Is really only the one who is who can be called a Sufi lam yuklak. The Sufi is not created. So it's not a question of simply putting people in categories. It's saying that it's a process, a continuum from the path once you enter the tariqa, the spiritual path, and you come in, you can be called. Uh, a mutasawwif or mustawsif, sometimes these terms are used, that one who is trying to assimilate Sufism on the path to being a Sufi. But they always say that the only true Sufi is the one who's in the third degree, who is burnt in the fire, who's gone. A Rumi, a Shams, a Tabriz, Ibn Arabi, these are the ones who are, if you like, the, the only ones who can be called Sufi in the full sense. But all of those who have made the, taken the oath of initiation have made the bay'ah to a spiritual master and who are now dhakirun, who are invoking the divine name and who are engaged in the jihad al-akbar against themselves, they can all be referred to as Sufis in a kind of general sense, while remembering that the most particular meaning of Sufi is the one who is who has had his alterity, his otherness, his engagement with this world and the next, all of that, those dimensions of his identity 
have been metaphysically extinguished through fana. And so what is remaining, what comes through such an individual, is what was expressed in the Hadith Qudsi. When I love the slave who comes to me through devotions of his own free will, is nawafil, meaning the dhikr, totally giving oneself through the dhikr to Allah Ta'ala, then I, God, become the hearing by which he sees, hears, the sight by which he sees, and so on. There's an identification, the supreme identity is how Genon referred to it. So, yeah, we, we don't want to get caught up too much on saying that this, the, only, the only Sufi is the one who has attained Fana and Baqa, and that everybody else is something else. No, the Sufis as a group, they call themselves often, as you know, the Fuqara, the ones who are poor. And the maybe next time we'll start with this point. Um, we, we, we've gone on a little bit too too much today. Um, but next time we'll, we'll start with Ibn Ata'ila's great uh, description of the Fuqara who are Zakirun, the ones who are invoking the divine name. So we'll start with that next time, inshallah. All right. Thank you very much, Dr. Reza. You're welcome. Uh, for the explanation and commentary on the uh, Shabu Bak, uh, the Book of Certainty. Yeah, thank you very much for everyone for uh, participating in this uh, program.